Good evening, I'm Zanagana. Welcome to the studio. Now you can hear me. All I was saying was that... Yeah, so my, I forgot to test the microphone. It actually worked, but never mind. I'm not going to deafen you by tapping it now. It looks like it's working. But all I was saying was uh, I was playing the intro and I suddenly realised that the camera, this camera, was on that computer over there and all you were looking at was the back of the um, drawing board. Which wouldn't make a well some people might think it makes a better picture but anyway those people aside um, or in front or wherever they are don't really care um we've done number three i think on here which makes the next one number four so the gibber is done we've beaten the gibber which i guess is the whole objective of the game isn't it um to beat whatever the person has, but <laughs> nearly. I've got a scalpel around here somewhere. There it is. I really ought to tidy up this desk, but I've been out today. So I am hoping this week to get some things done, like more on the 3D printer. Would be nice. And some of the other projects that have started finished off. Well, 
Whether I'll actually achieve that, mm, that's anybody's guess. But we shall see. So we're doing number four. Stay. Just like talking to uh, the rings in uh, chain mail, it's okay to talk to the plastic. It's just when it starts talking back that you have to worry. Hmm. It wouldn't have surprised me if most of those had been upside down. At least I'm not tipping them over the floor tonight. Well, at least not yet. And I hope that not yet lasts for the complete length of this stream. And ideally continues for the rest of the future. Because it's a pain in the neck to pick these up. Now I have noticed just recently two or three people doing magic dots or diamond painting. I believe it's called on uh, Twitch. I'm presuming they're using the real thing. Well, I don't actually know. Oh, I see. That's why it won't pick up. Can't get that one to let go. That is irritating. A swift flick. <laughs> With a thumbnail gets it to let go. Yes, yeah, so I was watching them because some of them I think sort of said diamond painting or, or 5D painting. I don't quite know what the 5D bit is, but because it, you know, you see it on some of these things as well. Um, unless again, that's just a manufacturer's name for it, for their particular version of it. But uh, I assume they really were using the diamond dots stuff. Then didn't really see any difference in what they were doing or what they were using. Okay, the one person I saw was using a tool that would let you put several dots on at the same time and stick them all down like five at a time in a row. But looking at that, it'd be, hard, it'd be a bit of a pain in the neck to line five up uh, on a, you know, a an area all the right way up to be able to put a pain down. To, they seem to manage it okay. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't actually ever see them line up the dots or anything, I just saw them tip the, uh, the, the end of the pen which, which carried the multiple things uh, into the tray and, uh, and picked them up so don't quite know how they managed it because I don't think the diamond uh, dots version is two-sided in any sort of way or form, I think it's the same as these but I guess if you could guarantee them all being the right way up, you could use that sort of tool when you get sort of four in a row like down there. Well, something's happened today, he says, trying to remember what it was. What is it I've done today? Mm, mm. I don't that was what I was trying to remember. I have switched electricity and gas supplies today. Which was fun in its own right. Don't understand it. Because one of the things you can do in the UK, for those of you that may not know, is we have these compact rock. Comparison websites 
that will, you know, for things like gas and electric electricity and telephone and things like that, uh, you can sort of tell them your usage and um, they'll tell you cheapest suppliers. And then they take a cut for you changing over. Um, I was looking at those today for my energy supply and as I have a I'm sort of slightly suspicious I was going to, you know, whoever they suggest I would go to the um, supplier's own website and see what they suggest <laughs> sometimes you get stuff even cheaper um, but I was, I was doing that on my own supplier current supplier and they get, they quoted me a price for the next year of so much. It wasn't quite the cheapest, but it wasn't far off. Kind of not worth the effort of changing suppliers, especially since any saving I get in the next 12 months will be negated by the fact that I'd have to pay more in the short term. Well, now the switching goes on. And uh, so I goes, okay, I'll sign up for my own supplier for the next year. Go through it all to the point where you start the payment bit. And suddenly they're quoting a price which is 50% more than they'd already quoted. Now, hang on a minute, that's not right. Don't owe them any money. They've told me how much energy I've used which is actually more than they told me a month ago for the year but anyway um, they've told me how much energy I've used they gave me a quote based on their own figures which they have and then when I come to the payment bit they're trying to charge me 50% more nah I don't like that I tried ringing them up their answer to this was, well, the quote bit is estimated and when you come to do the payment bit, it's based on actual figures. Okay. So how come you gave me the estimate and you're not using the same estimate when it comes to actually charging me? Hmm. You know, you're suddenly saying I'm going to use an extra 50% energy over what you estimated using your own figures which you got from reading my meters you're telling me I'm going to use 50% more energy next year than you estimate I'm going to use next year and therefore you're charging me because of that oh it's just because one's an estimate and one isn't and they would not answer the question basically they didn't know and they weren't prepared to go and find out so they lost the customer today because I went to the next one who was actually, well, what's it, the cheapest, certainly the cheapest on some of the comparison websites, but it was um, still significantly cheap. In fact, I reduced my bill by 30%, 33% to be more exact. I will do, but then use the estimated amount of energy. Now, theirs was an estimate. That's reasonable. That's okay. They don't know. Actually, they do. That's a fib because they can read the meter just as well. Because in the UK, the metre readings are all um, in a big database. But that's a different question. So now we're going to have them chasing us for a smart metre at some point, I guess. To which the answer is, not yet, thank you. Because the current first generation smart meters are not necessarily compatible with different suppliers and they may or may not get upgraded and they may or may not charge you correctly and they may or may not. Lots of may or may not. Mm. Anyway. You young ones won't have to worry about electricity bills and things like that for quite some time. I'll tell you what did amaze me. I use 5 megawatts of electricity a year. No, I use 5 megawatt hours of electricity a year, that's more accurate. That's quite a bit.
That's because the um, cooking's all electric. It has to be because cooking's all electric because all the light bulbs in the house are all uh, LEDs. So, I mean, although I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like twelve spotlights on in here. Um, if there were um, incandescent bulbs, that would be 600 watts of power. Uh, they're not. They're dimmable LEDs. So that's 70, 84 watts of power. That's a 6.6 .6 watts of 6.5 watts of piece. Absolutely amazing. So 600 watts, 6, 60 watts, 10%. LEDs are wonderful things. All the rest of the house is the same as well. Especially since most of our house is spotlights. So, can you imagine what the electricity bill would be if we had those? With inc incandescent bulbs. And your lady's hour does like incandescent bulbs. She likes the colour, so... I had to spend quite some time, so they're not necessarily the cheapest or the lowest power finding bulbs that were um, the right colour temperature and dimmable so if I have electronic control I don't have any problem with uh, turning them on or off because at some point that is something I want to do is automate them include some home home automation which will allow me to switch the lights on and off from anywhere I was reading another, uh, I mean, I was reading another uh, thing today, especially when, because I, I was reading all sorts of things to do with energy supplies, you know. smart home, I are smart light bulbs, they talk, you know, talk to your mobile phone, yeah, that's not smart, that's stupid, why would I want a light bulb that I have to go to the other end of the house for, turning all the lights on and off? to find a mobile phone to turn the light off or on. Totally stupid. Nothing smart about that at all. If it was smart it would know I wanted the light on before I had to get up to go find the mobile phone to switch it on. <laughs> and the first time you have a visitor in the house, who doesn't know that you don't switch off the light switch on the wall, you have to use a, uh, somebody's specific smartphone to do it, do your lights don't work anymore. Could you imagine somebody there with a mobile phone clicking on it and going, the lights are not working, the lights are, and the bulb's gone again, and there's no electricity, and somebody just switched the switch off and on. You really can't understand why people, sort of, oh, seem to be, I don't know, it's, it's almost like they've been taken in by this light bulb, this 30 pound light bulb and it, all it does is, is it uses your, so you have to supply the remote control to make it work. And that is a umpteen extra pounds for a smartphone. Even if you get the cheapest mobile phone going, you know, it's 30 pounds for the remote control. Doesn't seem very smart to me. <laughs> Here in that particular case, I'm talking about people, not the bulb. Which still doesn't seem very smart to me. However, once we do start with the smart home stuff, first thing we start with is radiator valves. Ones that will actually allow us to set an actual temperature and have the thing maintain the temperature. You know, like 21 degrees or 22 degrees as opposed to 4, which means anything. Because then once we can actually control the temperature, and most of those are remote controllable, 
we'll then be able to do things like, so to say, first thing in the morning you can be 22, rest of the day you can be 18 and then in the evening you can come up to 24 and do that sort of thing. And then add smart features to it because that's not particularly smart either. You can do things like, are you in the room? No. Let me get down a bit. Are you downstairs? Yes. And the upstairs down a bit. And your heating's a, a, an odd one. You've got to have a house that heats up quickly to uh, to make use of things like that. Things like the Nest thermostat and stuff. Because I don't think, I was about to say, I don't think it's intelligent enough to know how long it takes your house to heat up in order to um, know when you are going to be home in order to turn it up enough time early for you to, for it to be warm when you get there. I know it reacts to when you are there, but that's a bit late if you've just walked in and the house is cold. Yeah, I'm warming up. Be another 40 minutes, 50 minutes as well, yeah. Everything relies on smartphones these days. Just like uh, filling in uh, various forms today. Yeah. Mobile phone number. Why do you want my mobile phone number? Why does it have to be my mobile phone number? So you try and put in a landline number, it goes, that's not a mobile phone. Hmm. Well, I'm going to have your mobile phone number. Why? So in contact you. Why do you want to contact me in an emergency? Okay. What sort of emergency? Maybe your, your electric doesn't work. Well, the only time I've got a mobile phone on me is when I'm in, not in the house. And if the electric's not working, I'm not in the house. Don't really care. If I am in the house, I don't have the mobile phone on me. It gets stuck on a charger in the office where I can't hear it. No much point in having my mobile phone number. If you have the house number, I'll hear it ring, and I can answer it, or not if you're trying to sell me stuff. And if I go out, I can transfer my house phone to the mobile, so I'll still hear it ring. Now I'm going to have your mobile phone number. So, usually what I do is I give them the mobile phone number of a phone that I don't even switch on. It just sits in the drawer, it's an old one, uh, and don't switch it on. So they do have no contact number at all. So they can't send me text messages. They can't send me uh, voice messages. They can't leave me up in the middle of things. I'm waiting for... Um, the day when one of these companies goes, but we tried to contact you. Oh, okay, did you ring my house number? No, we don't have that number. Well, I've been in, but the mobile phone's broken. And I'm not buying a new one. Oh, I've turned it off because people kept ringing me up. Now, if you'd rung my home number... I am half tempted sometimes just to make up a number, but that just means to bother somebody else. Because they, they, most of them are semi-clever these days, they do actually know what number ranges are in use. You can't even pick a, a fictitious number. I was about to say, I wonder if in the UK we have 
uh, reserve numbers. Numbers are, uh, are not used because you, you see them used on television and radio. Only in America they do that. Uh, if you see somebody actually dialing a number enough to see what the number is, you always dial one of these reserved numbers that actually didn't go through to anywhere. Or might get a recorded message, I guess, but it doesn't actually bring the real person. And they're reserved specifically for it. But there again, um, I'm guessing suppliers would be a little bit, you know, people who want these not want you to put a number in is probably slightly intelligent enough to uh, at least check that you've not put one of those in. It's quite irritating in a way to have to for, for companies you're dealing on the internet and stuff like that. But we insist on a mobile phone number. So basically they're saying we won't do business with you unless you've got enough money to buy and, and maintain a mobile phone. Or well I suppose that's a commentary on it, but I mean that's that's an implied thing, isn't it? If you don't have the money to spend on a mobile phone. Why uh, Why should they insist on you spending it? Look, it's, it's, it's almost become mandatory these days for, uh, uh, for to buy some things on the internet. But you have a mobile phone. And I've had a discussion uh, more than once uh, where somebody's said we want your mobile phone and I've gone why you know because they have to if they want the data they have to explain why they want the data uh, it's a legal requirement that they do that for data collection um, and they've gone so we can send you a text message if for your delivery or stuff like that yeah well here's my home number oh we it's got to be a mobile number we're gonna be able to, we want to send you a text message yeah you can send text messages to my home number no, you can't. Yes, you can. You can in the UK. Uh, and uh, most organisations do not know that you can do that. Or well, certainly to um, uh, home telephone numbers on a BT line, they can um, do that. So anybody who, you know, even any of these, um, like, I don't know, I'll make it up, say Virgin, who might uh, rent lines from BT. They can have them delivered. Uh, text messages. Try it sometime. Send a text message to your own telephone number if you're in the UK. If you've got a phone that's capable of it, it will actually display the text message. If you haven't got a phone that's capable of it, it rings you and does text to speech. And if you're not there to answer, uh, it keeps trying periodically. I think it extends a period each time, like it tries in 5 minutes and then 15, then in an hour then four hours then the next day and then eventually stops but you can actually send them and uh, a lot of these companies just can't deal with that fact Yeah, you're not even allowed to say, I don't want you to send me a text message. You have to have it, whether you want it or not. And until recently, it was a case of, you know, even if you sort of said, I'm going on holiday or I'm going abroad, I don't want you to send me a text message because it costs me money for you to deliver that message to me. I don't want it. Oh, you've got to have it. Not so bad uh, now with the new European legislation that uh, says uh, you've, got, you've got to be charged the same as you would do at home, whatever that is. And call it roam like at home. Right, how you roam at home, I'm not sure, but anyway.
because certainly in the UK, most providers don't let you roam to um, other providers. So roam like you do at home, you don't know, at home. You <laughs> I think somebody uh, mis misrepresented that. Okay. Yeah, so, looking at energy tariffs today has had me sort of thinking about things like smart homes and things like uh, electric cars. and stuff like that so mileage on electric cars cost per mile and things like that because if I were to get an electric car this year which may or may not happen I have absolutely no idea but then of course it would be being charged on the current electricity tariff I've got so it's kind of on my new electricity tariff that I've got so I was kind of sitting down and going okay well you get like a 44 kilowatt battery, kilowatt hour battery and that's going to be for about let's say 130 miles so therefore you know 44 kilowatts at 14p a kilowatt hour and you know doing all the maths and working out it's about three pound per uh, 150 miles, I say about five pounds for 150 miles so it's about the price of a gallon of petrol you get about 150 under 250 miles out of it um, and then thinking hmm my current car gallon of petrol five pounds it's, it's more than that now but uh, 36 miles if I'm on a motorway about town 15 miles the electric's looking really cheap really promising and uh, really sort of money saving at the moment but then the question becomes do you because they're more expensive um do you save enough money to justify the extra cost although in my case i don't do the maths like that i don't go it's a twenty-six thousand pound car therefore uh you know and a petrol car will be x Therefore, do I justify the extra amount of money? I only ever look at with cars at uh, running costs and depreciation. So you, you know, I start with forget what the cost of the car is, and um, so how much does it cost me each year to run? And at the end of it, how much money do I get back when I sell the car? That's how much it costs me to have it for, let's say, three years or however many years I choose then that's the actual cost of the car um, because of course you get effectively get your money back at the end of it so you've spent the depreciation or whatever it is plus the, the, you know, the mileage, the MOT and the insurance and things like that and that way then you know and the cost of a loan if you have to, you have to get one you know what interest charges you may have etc but sometimes a what can be a more expensive car uh, or looks to be a more expensive car can actually be cheaper just because um, you know it's you know it's service charge may be a small service interval may be longer the insurance may be cheaper it may do twice as much to the gallon of petrol and things like that than you know, another car which is, appears to be cheaper but actually works out not to be or you know maybe one car gives you 60% of its value back at the end and another one gives you 10 and therefore your 60% one which may be more expensive to start with actually works out being cheaper at the end so 
I do that sort of mask when I'm looking at cars, not um, not actually how much it costs. Of course, you've got to be able to afford to buy the thing in the first place, of course, or get the loan for it, but um, I would usually do that sort of thing then on, on what they call a lease plan. A lease hire. Um, that way I don't have to pay out the money to start. <laughs> Somebody else does that. completely different way of looking at the cost of vehicles and uh, businesses do that a lot but not uh, not in the domestic market very much businesses are all interested in the the, um, the running costs as opposed to the capital expenditure the initial cost you know higher initial cost but cheaper servicing can be worth it for business so they look at it in a different perspective they look at running costs It certainly surprised a lot of salesmen in the past when they've been looking at it. You know, you go in and they're sort of, you know, trying to sell you on the cheapness of the car and then go, I'm not interested in how cheap it is, or how expensive it is. I'm interested in running costs. Hello Eddie Fall Guy, how are you? Welcome to uh, the stream this evening. And Wolfie, you were too far in Netflix. Must have been a good film line. How are you doing? You've been um, doing a lot of trucking just recently, Eddie. I noticed uh, various, uh, various streams. finished the uh, carving last night so I'm uh, well apart from the fact to do something different at the weekend just to give my neck a rest but uh, I finished the carving last night so um, got, uh, looking to do some of this to finish this project off and <laughs> then I'll have a look at what I'm going to do next I may, st I may start stabbing material with a really sharp needle and make turning into a rug. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I may finish off some of the other things I've got to do. Like the tank. Oh, okay. I kind of noticed the, um, of course, the, the other truck, but... Uh, um, yeah. I was, I was about to say it's a long time since I played the old truck simulator. Actually, it was Christmas. <laughs> so it's not that long ago. Um, but I haven't been on multiplayer for a long time. Just because at the time it was just... It was newly out and there was a lot of idiots. That and the, uh, the ports was just... A, in fact, I used to... I used to cheat. I used to... Um, If I played on the European server, what I'd actually do is, if I got to a, got near a port, or was going to go onto a, a port, I'd park up, change to the American server, go through the port, and uh, then if I felt like going back onto the European server, I'd switch back. <laughs> they still are idiots. Yeah. That's 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 the thing about the multiplayer stuff. It just mm, unless you're actually sort of playing with somebody, you know, you're in convoy like you you talking about there, um, then it sort of doesn't really. Well, I'm gonna say it doesn't really add much. It does, of course, because it's more lifelike. Because everybody else that you see on the road is a person driving, but.
I know at the time when I was doing, I was uh, when I when I was trying to multiply around, and one of the things I was doing at the time was doing some development work through the API for uh, uh, for some stuff I wanted to do in Euro Truck Simulator. And every time I went on to the multiplayer, I had to disable that, otherwise it wouldn't let me on. It's kind of like I'm only reading the truck status, <laughs> but of course it doesn't know. But it just knows that you're doing something on the API, therefore you could be cheating. Mm -hmm. Not quite sure how, but anyway. You tried going through the Rotterdam last night. You, yeah. You t I was about to say you have to leave a lot of space, but then somebody just pulls in in front of you and nicks all the space. And... Oh, they have cars now, do they? Well. I suppose. It's sort of semi, semi interesting in a way, isn't it, to have the cars as well if you can drive a car. I mean, I know it kind of doesn't serve a purpose game-wise, but if all you want to do is drive, which I guess is kind of what people do, they just want to drive the truck or the, the game. You know, the, the money thing is kind of incidental in a way. It just adds a bit of interest. If you can drive a car as well, I suppose, especially in the multiplayer map. Oh yeah, no, I, I know, that because they couldn't do the AI back then, I think, for what it was. I mean, effectively, I think what is what we were talking about at the time was sort of um, players replace the AI almost. You know what? I mean, with the multiple... Well, that's an interesting thing, with the... Um, With the multiplayer, it's I was, what I was about to say was the the buses would be an interesting thing in multiplayer, wouldn't it? It would be of more interest in multiplayer if the players could actually have a presence in the game, so they could get on the bus, maybe. <laughs> it would kind of be an interesting thing. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how you stop the idiots there. That would take some sophisticated um, AI, I guess, in a crash to go, this was deliberate, or it's not... Because, I mean, the one thing that always sort of uh, annoyed me, and it kind of annoys me in the standard game, um, is you know, you're driving along in an AI car drives into you. They do that sometimes, they just, you know. It, it's a situation where in real life a driver would never do what they are and they drive into you and you get fined. That always goes to me. He drove into me. He didn't stop at that junction or whatever, he just pulled out and I've got 30 tons on the back of me and I cannot stop in two feet distance and I used to, that winds me up a little bit. You missed the gibber. You did miss the gibber. You, uh, I finished that last night. I could show you if you like, uh, Wolfie. I mean, if you'd really like to see it, you know. You watching series? What the, the gibber series or of a Netflix series? I don't remember how many parts was it in. The last, the last part gets rele released tonight at 9 o'clock. You'd love to. Uh, okay. Well, I think we can probably do that. Let's put that down. One gibber coming up.
Mm. It's a little bit, can't quite get the camera in the right place, but there you go. I haven't decided if I actually want to colour like his teeth or, uh, you know, they put black in it. Mind you, his mouth looks black like that with the shadow, doesn't it? Um, or whether to give him like the green glowing eyes, but. Okay, Eddie, have a have a good look whilst coding. <laughs> Thank you, Wolfie. I think it looks quite good. It, it, it does look, it, you can see it a little bit better in real person. I like the camera lighting, it's not fantastically good. I will have to do something about that at some point, but. Um, ideally I could do with a ring light on the camera uh, with LEDs but that will have to wait until I can make a mount for it which will have to wait until I can um, afford it and then it will have to wait until I've finished building the 3D printer so I can print said ring mount but we'll get there Two terabyte. Your game is. Oh, your game's two, 22 gigabytes. Says there's no space. If you have a two terabyte drive with space on it, um, then that sounds like a badly coded game. Is it your game or a game? That's 20 gigabytes. What was that? That kind of sounds like a programming language that's got uh, a file space limit on it. There you go. Hmm. Triple A game. Ooh. Somebody's done some bad design then, unless of course you have a problem with your disk. Um, I don't even think there's a file, I mean at one time in, in, file, in the file system under Windows there used to be a limit to how many files you could have in a directory. I don't think there is anymore. It shouldn't really be saying you're reinstalling. Okay. Well that's the that's turning it off and then again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, typical uh, typical support uh, response. Turn it off and turn it on again. Yeah, reinstall. Mm. Mm. One of my first favourite games, daft as it sounds. It, uh, it was for Ladies Hour as well. We had um don't have it anymore, but we had um, a PS1. Uh, well, a newer generation PS1, so it was a small one, about that sort of size. And uh, we, we got a game for that, which was uh, snowmobile racing. So snowmobiles and a mountain. And um, that was... That's interesting, when you say snowboarding and, and skiing. This was yeah. This was uh, snowmobile driving, and um, it was uh, one of these progressive things. So you to you know you beat one track, you then got another, and so on. And on about the second track, out of about fifteen, in one particular place, there was always this bug, and it always crashed. And. Uh, You know, it wasn't it wasn't the disc because we had the disc swapped out or whatever. And it was kind of oh, it was a real pity. Still remember that game now. And if I could get that game to play, I'd play it because it was a really fun game to play. But uh, it's all the things you would never do. Yeah, yeah I'm not 
I'm not that into. I mean, I like. I can watch skiing, for example, the uh, Winter Olympics and uh, things like that. But I'm not that. Well, skiing sort of semi interests me. I'm not interested in in snowboarding. Um, but I, I have driven a snowmobile. So you tried. Uh, you tried once. What the skydiving? <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether I like the idea of skydiving or not. I mean, I can see, you know, it being in free fall and um, and that uh, and you know and that sort of whatever feeling, I guess. And um, you know, once you're under the chute, and it's kind of a bit like gliding and flying with the birds. And I can kind of understand that it's the bit in between where you go from not having a parachute open to having one open, where it may or may not, and that's. I know you've got a reserve, but you are you you're f afraid of heights. It's kind of weird for me. I'm I am and I'm not afraid of. No, I'm not afraid of heights. I don't necessarily like them. Um. So. I don't like, for example, going to a tall building, real tall building, going to the edge looking over. Don't like that at all. Um, it really gives me a really odd feeling. So things like these glass floors on, on like the, the, was it the Space Needle in Ontario, is it? Uh, where they've got a glass floor, that would freak me, freaks me out a little bit. But give me a safety belt, safety harness. I'll quite happily stand on, on the wall, you know, 40 floors up, as long as I've got a safety harness on and it's clipped, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll uh, quite happily um, stand on the edge of a wall uh, and look down, you know, walk across it, all these sorts of things. That doesn't bother me in the slightest, as long as I've got the safety harness on. Um, I can be stood on a, you know, stood in this, if you like, behind that wall and that wall can be up here so I can't even possibly fall off but I can't easily look over I always feel like for example my glasses are going to drop off or, or whatever and things like being on a roller coaster you know one of these where you just sit on it your legs are free always gives me uh, the weird feel like me you know, I'm worried my shoes are going to fall off or I'm going to drop the camera or something like that and yet I'm in a you know usually in a body harness at that point you stop beeping at me because I know your water's okay. Um, and that's kind of a weird thing. Not even then. Some roller coasters um, don't bother me. Um, I, th there's a place in the UK called Alton Towers. And at one time they had a, possibly still do, but they have a roller coaster where you actually end up, uh, when you're on it, or when you were on it, you actually end up sort of laid face down, if you like. A bit like your flying type of idea, I guess. Uh, and it sort of flies around and loops. And there, there were sort of people behind me that were screaming away. I was yawning. I could, I could quite easily have just nodded off. It was that relaxing to me. I did not find that scary at all in the slightest. And the only thing was uh, optical illusions, because um, the way you sat, it, it kind of looks like you get close to the concrete at one point, and I'm worried about my knees uh, catching, which they wouldn't, because you'd have been several feet away, but it just looked like that. But no, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. The ones that bother me was the older style, which are kind of like the wild, you used to call them wild mice, where you know, you come along and, and maybe go over the edge of a building, and it suddenly, literally, do a, a 180 turn um, in a, in about two feet. Um, so, and that that I was used to. I do not like that one at all. But uh, yeah, the you know they support this this particular, one, which is supposed to be the wild at the time, was supposed to be the wildest, most, and it was. Oh, I could go to sleep. I did not. Didn't feel anything. There are some that I don't like. 
I've been on. Um, I can't actually think for now what it, you know, when you because when you get off, you go. Mm, I don't really want to do that again, but I can't actually think what it was uh, about them. I mean, Alton Towers used to have uh, one that had in the UK certainly had one of the first corkscrew uh, ones. So you you were under positive G all the way around, but um, uh, but it was a corkscrew, and that was one of the first in the UK. I remember going on that, and that was fun. Wasn't scary at all. I even I, even, I don't know if I still got. I even had a mug which said I've been on the corkscrew, um, just because it was such a big thing at the time. You know, one of the first roller coasters that actually went inverted multiple times. Yeah, yeah. I did, well, yeah. I mean, it, it, I don't, I don't, not particularly have it on the roller coasters. I do. I, the odd thing is, I do have that same feeling of of like losing glasses and stuff on cable cars, the open cable cars, or or, or the ski lift type of uh, cable car as well, um, rather than enclosed. You know, like Swiss Alps enclosed type cable cars, so the, the you know the one two person seats and things. That always gives me that feeling. Uh, yeah, it's always kind of zipping all the pockets up and, and sort of making sure the glasses are on tight and my shoelaces are tied up and um, you know and, and the jewel <laughs> uh, the jewelry is fastened properly or I take it off and put it in my pocket even though it's perfectly okay and there's no reason why it's going to drop off. Take my watch off, you know. Yeah, it's um, uh, kind of weird. What number am I doing here? Number four. Okay. Number three is. Oh, I was in the middle of doing number three. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's weird how these sorts of things, have, you know, I'll well, say affect you, but you know, get, I suppose getting your mind in some ways. It's uh, let's now bring this up a bit more, and then we'll carry on with this. But yeah, roller coasters and stuff like that. One of the um, I went to was it uh, Universal Studios? Um, they right there that always got me was uh, was it the Tower of Terror? It was a lift, you know. So it's similar. You know, you, you went up and it dropped you. Well, it, it didn't actually drop you, but you you know, you're under control at the time because uh, there you actually lift. If you had it dropped so fast that you were in free fall for about a second. So you actually started to lift out your, your seat because um, the lift was going, you know, the, the ride was going down faster than you were. It's a vertical drop. Yeah, Tower of Terror. Um, did I post it on uh, Amina? I've posted um, a, an in-progress uh, picture. I haven't posted the final one on there. Uh, not yet, because I only finished it last night and I've been out all day today. I, I will be posting it, but just not yet. Um, I'm trying to think. The only other rides I don't like, if we, if we start talking about rides and things, is um, I don't like getting wet. Don't, even in places like Florida, where you try out fairly quickly. I, I don't like getting wet. <laughs> so things like the log rides, where you, you get soaked, it's kind of, I'm not really find this fun. The ride itself is okay, but the getting wet bit, which is usually right at the end. Nah, not uh, not so much interested in that, thank you very much. Yeah, one of our favourite rides was of thinking now about this Disney World, Disneyland, whichever one is in Florida. Florida. One of our favourite rides used to be the um, Golf, well, the golf ball, I'll say, the big ball. I'm trying to think what that was. Uh, you know, the start of Tomorrowland. Um, 
something to the future, I think it was, or something. Uh, with because uh, it used to be narrated by Walter Cronkite, and he has just he had just the right voice. <laughs> Full stop. Uh, but for for that sort of thing, is you know his narration, his voice was just perfect, and it's now done by somebody else using a different script, and don't think it's actually as good. It doesn't sound as impressive as it did with Walter Cronkite doing it. been there a few times now and it's kind of you kind of miss the rides that you remember of course so things like the um, what was it Captain Nemo rides with the, the Nautilus submarine and things like that and you know, last time we were there you could sort of see the pool of being drained because you could sort of see it through the things that they put in place to stop you seeing things. One of the most interesting things to, uh, that we did there as well is, um, if you don't mind seeing behind the magic so to speak, um, then there are sort of behind the scene tours that you can do, which sort of tell you how things are done uh, and you know, take you like in um, Florida, in in the main Magic Kingdom park, the the, the main road straight down the centre. There's a tunnel underneath it, and you they take you down there, and you can go there into almost any of the buildings. You can get up into almost any of the buildings, and uh, you know they take you um, through some of those areas. Uh, of course, you can't possibly see into some of the back scenes and see the things like where the floats are all prepared and how there are sort of some some places that you can't actually you can't normally get in. You know, some I uh, will say secret areas, but I mean there's things like there is a fully working club bar there which you can't normally get into. You have to pay a vast amount of money to be a member and things like that. And uh, so there's a lot of um, um, secret areas, if you like, in some of the uh, buildings and some of the rides where the, you know, like the employee restrooms, I guess, place it to rest, as in where they sit down and have meals and things, and employee restaurants and stuff. Kind of an interesting thing, if you don't mind seeing behind the magic. I mean, probably not something that's good for a young child to see, because of course they, they like the magic, but uh, it's magical to them, and seeing how um, how that magic is produced is uh, you know, spoils it, but for an adult I think it's, uh, it's really quite fascinating. No, that's that. That seems quite intelligent. <laughs> there, uh, Eddie does that because it's all, it, it, it is always a bit of a pain in the neck when you're starting streaming to, to fire everything up. I use um, I use a stream deck, and I still haven't got it fully programmed up. But I can start OBS. Actually, I can't start OBS, but I can start. Um, the music playing, for example, pretzel. Um, I just haven't put the put OBS in there, but I because I'm I'm using two computers. Uh, I've got the one over there which has got chat in it and it's got um, Streamlabs and what have you on it. So I have to start that up manually, but I should get around to doing the same sort of thing. And. Uh, You're going to go watch your series. Okay, you'll return in a few days. Fair enough, Wolfie. That's a, 
That's a big series, is that? Especially if you're watching them back to back. Yeah, I did kind of think of putting something together like that AD when, uh, especially because I am, yeah, I'm because I am using the two computers. It was it's a bit of a, a pain setting up, but the. Um, when I saw the stream deck, I thought that is just uh, just ideal, and it, it's. I used to do OBS by using a remote control, and I don't do that anymore because the stream deck does it all. <laughs> okay, see you on Monday. Uh... Why? What? I mean, should okay. The Stream Deck should interact with OBS, no matter whether you've got a game full stream or not, because it doesn't. I, I, I'm guessing the issue being um, for things like Streamlabs, perhaps, is it's trying to send keystrokes, um, and therefore anything that's you know, at front of screen will uh, will grab those streamlabs what's streamlabs obs then i'm missing it i'm missing something there um but there again i haven't looked at streamlabs or obs for a little while And will your game support um, full screen windowed, borderless window? Because that's another way around it sometimes, because then it's still a window. It's a new OBS. Okay, I shall have to have a look at that. I haven't, um, I haven't been particularly keeping up with it uh, as such. I'd be kind of surprised that um, if Stream, if uh, Stream Deck, uh, you know, Alligator doesn't uh, start to work with it, if it's going to be a good, uh, a good thing. The well, um, last thing I knew anything about OBS was it would, it, it had had um, the mixer. Uh, uh, FTL protocol associated with it. I shall have to have a look at that after the stream then. See what it is. What does it do then that um, OBS doesn't? Because last time I was looking, the, the, the new version of OBS had just launched, and which did did things like uh, would let you project all the all the scenes onto a monitor, so that you could actually just click the scene that you wanted to transition to it. I think that was the last um, thing I picked up off of the OBS uh, latest OBS update. You don't need to use um, hotkeys. Well, okay. Streamlabs OBS. You might need to use hotkeys, I don't know. 
Um, but for the uh, for the um, standard OBS, you don't. It, it is tied uh, directly into the API. Um, in fact, the uh, stream sorry uh, stream decks uh, Alligator supply a plugin for OBS, uh, and you um, you just select the the scenes directly, uh, and it switches them through the LP, uh, through the API. Because that was one of the problems I used, kind of one of the problems I used to have with it, one of the remote controls that I tried was just uh, sending keystrokes, and that didn't work because of um, I needed to have a web interface or a, a two computer interface. Yeah, it's just it's just Eli, it's just Eligato or somebody writing the um, the plugin for it, I guess. Okay, stream has an OBS. I'll have to have a look. Hmm. Chatbot, I'm not fantastically bothered about. Um, really? You know, if it's if it's two, I mean, I don't interact with it on a uh, you know during the stream generally, so that sort of thing doesn't bother me. Too much. I should show what bit of OBS I would want integrated myself. I shall have to have a look and see. Though so, uh, in this setup here, I really can't uh, can't see myself using uh, using anything else other than Stream Deck, just because you know the the streaming computer is over there. It's a few feet that way, and um, I use. The monitor, uh, another computer here, and if to try and put up, I mean, I could write as you've done uh, an interface, but it would mean um, I've got another thing. I've got two windows open on that screen at the moment, so the stream labs and the um, and the chat. I'd have to have a third one, which I'd then be switching between them, uh, you know, to try and find the right thing. And uh, the stream deck just sat down here at the side of me is. Um, it's fantastic because I've got just about everything I want to use on there uh, at the moment. Anyway, I don't um, do. I don't actually. I was, I was thinking that there is there is sort of one function that I can't quite do. And I can't actually remember what it is. Because I know <laughs> another first time I saw the uh, the OBS interface, you know, the OBS thing on um, on the Stream Deck. I'm looking at it and going, "There's only about four functions." And um, the um, is only about four functions. Because I know the the, the web the web one. Um, had a lot more, seemed to have a lot more functionality uh, when I was on uh, the older version, not necessarily, you know, because it's gone through a, a few iterations. I can't remember, but I've kind of turned myself out of using it, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's, it is one way of doing it. I know I, the way I was, well, the way I was going to do it, if I was going to do it, would be um, I'd provide a, I'd do it to a web, web rather than writing a, an app, you know, a two-part application as you've done, one to sit on the PC and one to you know, the remote device, and one to sit on the local device on, on the streaming PC. Um, what I was, the way I was going to intend to do it was, the streaming PC had a web-like interface on it. So that I could use some, a browser, um, which would then let me use a smartphone, for example, or a tablet, or a PC, or basically anything. I could even get like a, you know, a, um, an Amazon Fire tablet, which is about thirty quid, uh, and use that as the interface. Because I could then also put, you know, like put a chat window on the same thing, or even just have two, so that I didn't actually have to have a an IBM PC. 
What are we going to type then? Allah, having said which, the thought just crossed my mind. You can get um, a version of Windows for IoT um, for the Raspberry Pi. And, I'm, and that runs some applications, so I wonder if you could use that to run a remote. Whether it would have the sufficient libraries on. I don't know, interesting thing. Yeah, no, it's a because I mean, they, um, as you know, because <laughs> uh, as you know, because you're the guy that um, that said it. Um, I am hoping this year to actually do my one day to try out of um, uh, glasswork, and um, if that. If 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 I enjoy working with glass as much as I hope I would enjoy working with glass, then I might well set up a glass studio, uh, and that would actually have to be at you know in an outbuilding, and um, then it start I start um, in the thing is if I want to stream doing that, how do I go about doing it? Because I'm not going to carry that PC out. Bit big everything. Um, you know, this the, don't really want to carry a PC out at all. But I mean, I've got a tablet here, which may or may a you know, portable PC, I guess, uh, here, which may or may not be powerful enough. And I've got a few others around that I can run Linux on, which may or may not be powerful enough. But kind of one of the things um, I was thinking of doing was to. Uh, uh, it's relatively easy to push the uh, camera video across the network uh, and you know, have it pop out on the on the streaming PC. But then I need to remote control the streaming PC from out there. So having cameras out there as opposed to a, a full PC, which is more attractive to people wanting to nick things. Um, you know, a camera on its own is kind of not so much of a big deal. And I, you know, I've been sort of remote control. Then becomes a quite a an important aspect if you if you you know if your streaming PC is actually sort of ten yards away uh, through a couple of doors and things like that. Then it becomes more important. So you can play sound clips, yeah. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I know it, it takes up about 30% of the CPU on that um, machine. Uh, or rather, it does when I'm recording the video at the same time, which is what I do. Otherwise, it takes about 20%. It's not actually, it's not actually too bad a load on that machine. But, um, it's something I, you know, I, I keep meaning to try it, maybe on a Unix-based machine. But I've just never got uh, got around to it because I'm kind of not too bothered, even if it sort of runs the machine at sort of a fairly high CPU level. And you don't want to have to buy another one just to, to act as a streaming machine. Cam signals. Cam signals aren't too. There's a couple of ways of doing the cam signals. Um, there is well, there's there's two or three ways of doing the cam signals. The, um, the simplest one is something like well, something like a Raspberry Pi, for example. Either acting as a camera itself with its own camera interface on them. It's not a bad camera. Um, or acting, you know. Um, with a webcam plugged into it, because it will handle HD video quite quite well. Uh, it can push out a protocol, real-time streaming protocol, RTSP, and you can run a you can run a client because <laughs> it's backwards. The thing with the camera is the server. You can run a client on on the on the machine with OBS, and OBS can connect to the 
actually OBS can connect directly to the server. So you can, you know, is, when you sort of shoot, you know, you say which camera, uh, you know, when you're setting up the video source, you instead of sort of choosing a camera, what you do is you say it's a, it's a bit like choosing a video file, um, but instead of it's, you know, C colon backslash, it's RTSP colon. Uh, and then the uh, server. The other thing with that is you then got um, something like, well, the best I could get down to was about a 20 second, literally a 20 second um, buffer. So, I mean, um, Twitch already adds about 30 seconds, so I was, you know, ended up being about 50 seconds behind because uh, I tried it literally with a Raspberry Pi here to act as a third camera and uh, had to slow everything else down. The other way of doing it is you, you can actually get um, well, a couple of ways, I've <laughs> just thought of another way. You can actually get applications, two-part applications, which uh, are just like USB extenders. So, you know, USB goes in one end, comes out, effectively comes out the other end, but it acts like a USB port on your host PC. So, you know, your OBS would just pick it up as a camera. I haven't actually tried that. I mean, the other thing that just came to mind is um, VN, you know, VNC, for example, or, or similar, because if you run VNC on the remote computer, showing you your desktop computer, then um, you can forward uh, USB ports or any other port over that connection as well. Which in theory, as long as you've got a reasonably fast network, should be okay to transport a USB connection. I don't know what the latency would be. It's something I haven't tried. Actually, it'll be something I probably should try. Either I'll just see whether the laptop works. Because uh, I should be able to do the same thing with the microphone thing, or the microphone. Oh, if all else fails. Um, it's... Uh, you've got... you have... I think, yeah, well, it's, there, are, there are technologies available, so I've, again, it's just it came to me. I mean, at one time you could get what they would call TV senders which will send a, a, a video signal uh, by wireless. There are um, things like wireless USB extenders and uh, stuff like that, which uh, may well also do the job. Actually, it'd be one of those things that you'd actually have to experiment with. I mean, here in the here in the studio where I am now, it's not. Although I am, you know, a few feet away, you can get you know three meter USB cable. It's not too much of a problem. It is just finding something you you kind of like there. to act as that um, interface. if you are already doing things like playing uh, music and stuff through yours and that's uh, that's an, a fantastic achievement I have a tendency to um, want to do things like uh, if I was going to you know, play like the music clips and things, I'd be wanting to put that on an external device. But that's just me, and mix the audio in separately. That's just my background though, that makes that more logical to me than running everything on a PC. Kind of why I don't have a USB microphone. Well, so I said I have a USB microphone. I don't have a USB microphone. 
uh, although it is plugged in over USB. Um, uh, I, it, it's an analog microphone I've got, I just happen to have a, a USB connected digital to an analog to digital converter. Um, but that's that's partly because I can do things like have a 15 metre uh, microphone, analog microphone lead, without a problem. A 15 metre USB, that's more of a problem. So the analog domain is um, a lot easier to deal with at, uh, at distance. Yeah, and apart from, yeah, I mean, I could even, uh, if I was talking about working out in the garden, I could even literally run uh, an audio cable the full length, and it wouldn't be a problem. I could even do it over Cat 5. <laughs> Actually, now there's an idea. If I was going to do it, what I'd probably do is, is run a fibre optic, actually. Fibre optic pair. Then I'd just extend the LAN out there. Because I was thinking about various ways of doing it. Because I've got a, what might be described as a professional wireless setup here. Because it's got three, um, three wireless units in the house. Because it's because of the layout of the house, I need uh, three uh, Wi-Fi units and they um, collaborate with the central controller so I've got handoff between them and all sorts of things like that and I was sort of thinking about maybe setting up a point to point out into the garden but um, you've got limited bandwidth even you know, even over um, a high bandwidth uh, wireless link so the, the thought never crossed my mind of mind you then it becomes a case of how do I get a fibre optic into the house <laughs> That's the other question. Wireless is easy. Um, um, power line is easy. But um, fab optic isn't. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it's just whether I want to pull up carpets and go crawling under the floor. If I, if I wanted to do that, I can I, I can do it, and it's trenching the garden, but at least I built a wire into the main hub. Yeah. We even have a wiring cabinet here. Uh, number number four. Any more number fours that I can see before I switch to... It's not a difficult job. It's just dusty and dirty crawling under the floorboards. Because we've got air brakes, so it's, you know. Actually, getting onto the path would probably be hard. Because <laughs> we have a resin path. So we'd need to... Oh, no! Uh -huh. I, I, I've just remembered I had the builder put... Um, hopefully he put it in. But put a, a, a conduit pipe in under the resin path. So if, it, if he did put it in, and he didn't tell lies, um, then I've got a, a tube under the path, so... I can get a, a fibre optic through that and uh, up into an air brick straight through. So, yeah, that's an idea. Just have to crawl. Oh well, that that would not be something I will be even need to think about until after I've tried out. Because if I don't like glass work, then I won't be doing it. Uh, so we'll go back to number three, which is the black, because I haven't done that all of this number three. Well, I've got a studio in the house. <laughs> yeah. I just don't want to be. Um, I do not want to be running uh, an, an oxypropane torch in the house. That's the main thing about it. I don't even really want to run it in the. Um, could potentially run one in the garage, I guess, but I'd quite like to get the cars in the garage one of these days. So, yeah, in the garden. 
But you, I don't know if you've seen Facebook. You've seen what my garden is like. So could you imagine? Uh, there's a shed there that you can see. Could you imagine using that as a studio? Uh, and the views from um, from there are quite fantastic. I know me whenever I go up the garden, um, I get near the top. Always makes me want to take the computer up there, sit up there and paint. There are apps, you know, because of the, the, the views across uh, where we live, the, we're on the side of a valley, so you can leave, look right across the valley. Yeah, well, it was you that kind of phrase, if you remember, uh, AD. And I was talking about it, <laughs> and of course you proved to be uh, potentially accurate. <laughs> oh no, that's the idea. That is literally the idea. Um, uh, I intend, the, the intention is, when some other things are out of the way, which is sort of been trying to get these other things out of the way now for well over a year but hoping that will be soon now um, the intent is to go spend a day with uh, in court to local that's within 100 miles of here uh, a local glass blow uh, who offers that as you know it's about 100 pound for the day I think uh, and uh, and see whether I like it before I because uh, a torch and uh, extractor and uh, oxygen generator and um, glass etc is several hundred pounds so it's not it's not something I want to spend just in case or, or just to find out so yeah it's the idea is to go um, go spend a day playing with glass uh, with somebody who can at least do semi teaching or do some teaching so I get to have an idea about what I might like or stuff like that and try different things like glass blowing as opposed to just glass work um, because it's um, I spend a bit of time sort of looking because there, there are some that will let will just show, show you how to do things like beadwork and I don't want to do I'm actually all interested in beadwork might be if it's commercially viable to at least pay for the glass, but um, I kind of interest in sculptural glass. So it took a while to find a place that would uh, would that offers that. It's, um, it's a bit too expensive to sort of try it out, you know, to buy the stuff and try it out. I suppose, well, the, the, uh, if I was just wanting to work, I guess, with soft glass and just do a few beads, there is something called a hothead, which is probably works out about £40 um, to buy, but then you spend a lot of money in gas and things. But that... Um, if I just wanted to sort of try playing about with a little bit of glass, that is one alternative I could do, but that's nothing like using a proper torch. Because the, the hothead is basically a blowtorch um, using map gas, which is just hot enough to, to, um, to work soft glass with if you take your time. So that kind of is a possibility, but I really don't want to do that. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like a good investment. Plus, even if it's only like a day's course, the amount of extra knowledge you'll get from someone having, sh someone showing you how to do it properly, is uh, I think worthy, worth the cost. 
At least that way, because I mean, it's. I know I've got uh, started a few things. Uh, just to try, I mean. Uh, and, and got the kits to start with, like the chainmail I did, and um, uh, some of the other things he says, suddenly trying to think what it was um, that I've got, where I've bought, I've bought kits of things to try out, you know, because the kit gives me everything that I need, and I know then that if if I can't do it, or it doesn't work, it's, it's because I'm, I don't like it, or I don't have the skill to do it, it's not the fact that I've got the wrong tools or something like that. And uh, it sort of strikes me with, whilst I could go out and get a hothead, uh, if, I, if it didn't work or the glass shattered or I was, you know, I'd never know whether it's because I'm trying to do something that the thing isn't capable of, or whether it's something I'm trying to do something I'm not capable of. And that's you know, and so I yeah, couldn't end up go you know, couldn't end up spending more money for something that I actually am not no good at, just because I think it's the equipment. So yeah, I'm going to try a professional's tools. At least I know it's not the tools. <laughs> I'll actually tell that story AD of that that stream long long ago <laughs> where I said um, I'm absolutely fascinated by glass blowing but I'm not actually ever going to go out and, and you know buy glass blowing equipment and set up a studio and because I always remember you gave a one word comment to that which was yet <laughs> and I still tell that story and of course, you are proving to be right, but that is because I found out. Um, I, I actually found out that it wasn't as expensive as I thought it was. That was from watching um, Pucky Ranger, who just one day mentioned the hotheads were you know really cheap, and I looked them up, and they were. But then I decided yeah, I really didn't want one of those, but then I saw the price of real torches, which are not cheap, but they're not actually as expensive as I thought they were. And since then, the idea has just grown. <laughs> yeah, you did. That time you did. Actually, it's now nine o'clock. Well, I don't think it's nine o'clock. I know it's nine o'clock because I've just looked at the clock, which is about time I gave up for this evening and uh, did a few other things. At least I do not have to spend 15 minutes vacuuming up wood shavings. That's the only thing about some of these crafts, like the carving, is they just take a, an appreciable amount of time to. to to set up before the stream and to break down after the stream. At least Magic Dot is kind of, I've tidied up, I'm done. <laughs> and I can go get a drink and do some other things. So we are at the end of the stream for this evening, 9 o'clock. I will be on again tomorrow night. Hopefully. From approximately 7pm UK time. That's GMT at the moment. Or 
UTC, if that's more familiar to you. They're both the same. And I will be starting as soon after 7pm as an evening meal allows me to. I try and start as close as I can, but occasionally things um, uh, just time just slips away. So I do eat before the stream. It's a lot more fun that way, because otherwise all I'm thinking about throughout the whole stream is whatever it is I'm going to eat afterwards. And that's completely distracting. Uh, as well as prompting me to maybe finish the stream earlier than I want to. <laughs> but, uh, it happens. But we'll probably, well, we will be carrying on with this because I want to finish this. It's kind of, I want to get some of the projects out of the way. I've started this, so I'll finish to nick a catchphrase from years and years ago. Although I suppose it's still a valid catchphrase. The television program, I think, is still on. And uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not necessarily, even next week, I don't think I'm going to start anything particularly new, although I do have a project in mind which I might start. Um, but I might just, well, I'd like to try and finish off some of the other things like the remote control tank and uh, the 3D printer and the laser cutter and um, other things, the six wheel Tyrrell Ford that needs the body case painting and uh, a few things like that would be good to finish those sorts of projects off which have been set on the shelf for far too long. But the other thing I've got uh, thinking about doing is I've got a load of walls sat behind me. It would be good to use those up and I've got some rug canvas and I've got a sharp stabby needle uh, for joining the two together. So it might be something that I'll start and do one of those large-ish sort of rug with some sort of pattern on it using whatever wool I've got, just maybe even just random things because you get really if you're ever feeling frustrated or annoyed at somebody, it's a real good thing to do because you can stamp the needle through the, uh, through the canvas. You just have to watch where your hand is because if you miss it hurts. <laughs> Depending on how annoyed you're feeling at the time, of course. Um, but it's uh, it can be good fun to do that. Uh, and especially if you are doing it with your hand because of course you know where your hand is so you're stabbing between but people are watching across the room and don't know where your fingers are when you're doing it does make people cringe but anyway <laughs> so we'll be doing something but i suspect I'll, I'll carry on doing this until we finish it and then that's out of the way yeah. oh, i may just say this week. i don't know basically you want to see what i'm doing tomorrow night pop into the stream and have a look and same for the rest of next week uh if i'm feeling really confident about what I'm going to do, I'll tweet it, but um, it, hmm. it may be I'll just decide 10 minutes before the stream and we'll see. Uh, so, if you have been watching to nick somebody else's catchphrase, thank you for doing so. If you haven't been watching, I don't know quite why I'm bothering saying it, but anyway. I hope I'll see you on the next stream. Bye for now.
Thank you.